Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. Like with all of my videos, I will include links to each section of this video down in the video description so you can jump from one section to the another if you like. So this week I have a couple of tidbits to share with you off my social media feed. I have a finished object. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the knitting artwork that I have here in my office that I don't think I've ever shown you guys. I'm pretty sure I haven't. And then I want to talk about how to learn more about knitting and how to experiment with it so that you can sort of take charge of your own learning when it comes to knitting. So let's get started. There was something that showed up in my feed this week and it was about these Egyptian Coptic socks that are part of a collection in a museum in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. And it, the, the link that I'm going to put down in the video description is a link to a woman's blog post. And she is talking about um, some photographs that she had found about um, of different objects in the museum that weren't that didn't necessarily have enough attribution to them to, for her to tell if they were uh, multiple objects or if they were all the same object. And it was sort of about her quest to figure out, um, to put all those pieces of the puzzle together. And so it's about a sock that's, I think it's close to 2000 years old. It's somewhere between 1500 and 2000 years old. I think it, that was um, from Egypt and it was described in 1897 as a knitted sock as uh, oftentimes in older histories of knitting they'll talk about the oldest uh, knitted item that was found would be you know something from Egypt and it, it turns out that the archaeologists that were describing those things didn't understand textiles well enough to know that that wasn't actually knitting it was something called um, nala binding or literally needle binding it's a it's a technique that's um, that's more similar to sewing and can use shorter lengths of yarn um, it's not like knitting where you're pulling a loop through or what's called a bite of of the yarn through where so that with knitting you can have a literally an infinitely long ball of yarn it doesn't matter but with something like this technique that was used in these socks you it's like sewing where you have to pull the entire thread through each loop so you need shorter strands so within this blog post that she has is a little video that includes these socks and it was showing some kids going having a night at the museum and seeing different Egyptian objects and the kids have a little discussion about the sock it's one of those socks where um, it has a divided toe and which is meant that you could wear them with sandals and those socks have always <laughs> kind of confused me because they look like they're divided completely in half like there isn't room for just um, the big toe and then everything else is with the the other toes if they're just divided in half and the idea is that you could wear them with sandals that have like a, a thong in the in between the two toes which said to me that then then that division for the toes must have been in the middle of the sandal so I wish I could I could see somebody wearing these types of socks and I'm wondering if they're symmetrical like that so that it would allow the person to wear them on either foot and maybe the shoes were that way or the sandals were that way too they could be worn on either foot I don't know I'd be curious to find out more but in addition to this little video there is a link to the the process of this sock um, going through conservation and the process that the textile expert did because the sock when they had it was very flattened and creased and it was so old and fragile that they had to be very careful in terms of creating it so that it could be put on put on some kind of a form and displayed as it would have been worn and that to me was super interesting so the, the link that I'm going to give you is to the blog post about the woman who is finding these random photographs and trying to get a bigger picture but at the bottom of that blog post is then a link to that process of conserving this 
um, piece of textile work. It's just really interesting and I, and I thought you would enjoy it. The other little tidbit is really just an update from last week. So last week I was telling you uh, about a book that my friend Ole Petter in Sweden had recommended to me called The Mitten Book. And I had been a little confused about it when I was first looking for it because there seemed to be two different books out that one of them was called the Swedish Mitten Book and then this one was called the Mitten Book and I'm like, was, was it the same thing? Was it something different? And then I was further confused because the stitch patterns that are used in here to, to, um, to knit these mittens, every one of these stitch patterns has a mitten that, that was knit with the stitch patterns. The stitch patterns have been co collected by a woman um, who was born in the 19th century and her book of the stitch patterns was published in 1925. So I wasn't really clear about what was different about that original book compared to this book. And so this book just explains that she'd collect, connect, collected all these patterns and they wanted to make sure that her work continued on. So I really wasn't confident that that what they were doing was just reprinting the actual stitch patterns, but they had created these mitten patterns. I really didn't know. So what Ole Petter watched last week's video and he said that he actually has a reproduction copy of the 1925 book. It was a facsimile a copy was published back in 2014 and he has a copy and a friend of his bought up all of the remaining copies of it. So he's going to at some point get me a copy of it and send it to me. But what he tells me is that originally she had those stitch patterns in there, plus there were some original garment designs included in there. So what they've done here is just take the stitch patterns and put them on mittens. And what the original woman had done was collected the stitch patterns, put them in this book, in her book, and then had some different garment patterns in there. So I'm looking forward to, at some point, getting to see what the original book looked like. That will be really super interesting. So I know some of you, several of you left comments that you have this book um, as well. So, um, so I'm looking forward to spending a little bit more time with this. Maybe this summer I'll make a pair of mittens from here as well. I have one finished uh, project this week, which is the socks that I had started from my brother uh, last week. Um, and it's using, the yarn is a Regia six ply yarn and it is thicker to me. I have to use a little bit bigger needle and I gauge the stitches are a little bigger than other six ply sock yarns that I use. Like the Cascade Heritage 150 is a little bit um, thinner and I, and I can use a smaller needle on it and, and I then need more stitches. So this is, is a pretty thick six ply yarn and the colorway is called something like blueberry. So it's mostly kind of a tonal gray to black and then there are these little bits right here every so often that are kind of a purpley red color and they they just happen so occasionally that uh, this is going to be one of the rare occasions where I was going to make no attempt at all to try to match the two socks. I just thought well the pink or pink or red or purple or whatever it is occurs so infrequently and it's kind of random I'll just knit the second one wherever the first one ends. And so I knit the second one and it turned out that they're almost, they're almost exactly lined up the same. They're a little bit different. Um, the stripes don't match up completely exactly, um, but they are, <laughs> what it looks like is that I intended to make them match and then they didn't quite do it. it it's kind of, uh, surprising to me that they ended up matching as well as they did. So these will go off to my brother. Um, oh, I want to, want to show you something. There was a discussion in the Ravel, my Ravelry group in the past week where somebody asked about uh, sock blockers. Does anybody use them? Are they really necessary? So sock blockers, they can be like a solid plastic, kind of like a foot shape or they could be like metal or plaster, mine are, I have some that are metal and they're just that, that outline shape and you can put, you can wash the sock and then put them on the sock blocker and then it puts them in this perfect shape. 
And um, she wondered if anybody uses those. And those of us who answered said, we, you know, we don't, they're not necessary. Like if you're, if they're for your own feet, when, you know, you put your sock on, it's going to stretch to that uh, circumference. It's going to fill out. Um, the only time that I use them is if I'm knitting a pair of gift socks and I'm using a stitch pattern that's going to draw in or it's going to look bad when it's relaxed. So the idea is that when they open the gift, they can see the fabric opened up and looking nice um, in the box. But after that, they just, you know, I just tell them then, then, you know, when you wash them, they're going to pull in and it'll be fine because you'll put them on your leg and they'll stretch out and they'll look good. Um, so that's the only reason I use sock buckers. And one, I think it was this woman named Bonnie, I think it was her, she said what she, the, the tool that she really likes is a sock ruler. And so we were talking about sock rulers. And now this is a gadget that I had heard about and I had no, I, it was one of those things that I thought was just a gadget and there's no reason to use it. And what it is, it's, it's this right here and there are markings on it in inches and centimeters and it has uh, this little shape right here. And it can be used to, if when you're measuring uh, the length of a sock, um, the, so if I'm knitting, if you're knitting a, t a toe up and you want to start your heel at a certain point, you, you insert this into the sock up to the end of the toe and then you can see on the edge of the knitting how long um, the sock is. What I use it for, because I do cuff down, is I stick it in the sock and from the heel and then so that I know when to start the toes. And so this is one that's kind of like a medium size adult or it's an adult size or something. And it's about three and a quarter inches wide. So that means it's smaller than an average adult sock, which is fine because you don't actually want the sock to stretch when you're measuring it. You wanna know the actual length of, of the thing without it stretching because if it stretches, it's going to shorten it and you wanna know the exact length. So this works really well for my own socks or socks for my daughter or whatever. But my brother has very big feet. So his feet are 11 and 3 eighths inch in circumference, which means that I knit the foot of the sock to be about 10 inches, maybe slightly bigger than that around, which means it's five inches wide. And this kind of, it, it kind of is uh, loose in there. And in this discussion about sock block, uh, sock rulers, somebody said, oh, I just made my own out of some cardboard. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So what I did was I made a sock blocker out of cardboard that I can use for my brother's socks so that the, it'll fit better. And, and I know that I'm not, you know, kind of bouncing it around a little bit in there. And so what I did was I used the original one. I just wanted it to be an inch wider and I wanted it to be longer too because that's the other problem is I would be measuring the length of things and it would come right to the end of the ruler and I was like trying to you know figure out if it was uh, fitting correctly or not. So I use this as kind of a, a template just to um, to get the an idea of what that bottom curve was kind of like and I made the sides each a half inch wider and then I just kind of it didn't have to be perfect. It just kind of made it so that it would curve around there um, so that it will fit the general shape. So, and then I marked the inch marks that I was going to need on here um, in order to measure his socks. So I made sure that it was longer and wider in order to fit him. Um, so if this is the kind of thing that you are interested in, like just not making your own, but you just want to buy one, this, um, I'll put a link down in the description. I think they sell these on Amazon. I'm not sure where I got mine, but I'll, I'll put a link down below. But again, you can, you can make it out of cardboard and, and just, um, plan for that curve. You know, how long that curve is usually going to be somewhere between two, two and a half inches long. And then you can just plan it accordingly. So I only did that sock. That was it because, uh, this weekend I was making masks again, this time for my daughter living in the Netherlands. So I was making, um, more than one. I was making, uh, nine of them all together so that she would have three, her boyfriend would have three, and then she has a friend, 
um, she asked me, could I, could I make some for her friend? Because they're, they're going to be required to go out, there's going to be a requirement to go out and wearing a mask in, in public um, pretty soon. So uh, I wanted to make those for her. So Sunday was Mother's Day here in the United States. It was Mother's Day in a lot of countries, but some countries do it in, I think, maybe in April instead. So each of my girls was calling me while I was working on the masks. And I was at the point where I was sewing the elastic in. And up to that point, I've been kind of being very methodical and careful because I wanted to make sure that I was doing a good job. I wouldn't have to rip anything out. And so I was doing, every, you know, really kind of like an assembly line process. And then uh, Sophia called me and I was talking to her and I was sewing elastic. And then Nina called me and I was like, oh, I'm going to talk to your sister now. And, and so I was talking to Nina and I was doing the elastic. And then, you know, I finished talking to them, ate some lunch. When I got back to work on the mask to do the next part after the elastic, I realized I had sewn the elastic in, in the wrong direction. And I was being so careful to use backstitch across everything. It was such a pain um, to have to try to, to rip that out. And I just put everything in a timeout for a couple of days. And I finished everything up on, I think it was Wednesday. So masks took up some of my time. And I'm working on an article for next week as well. So for this week, that's it for my finished objects. So I spend most of my day in this little tiny room. The room is about, I think it's about seven feet by 10 feet. And then there's a closet that's about a foot and a half deep by maybe eight feet or seven feet long. So the closet's pretty, pretty big and there's no doors on the closet. And most of the wall space is taken up with these kinds of, of storage units or there's windows. So I don't have a lot of wall space, um, but the wall space I do have, I like to put up things that are knitting related that I enjoy looking at. And I have one, one framed print that I have right near my desk that I look at quite a lot during the day when I'm just kind of staring, I like to look at it. Um, and then I have two other pieces that I haven't put up on the wall that I want to do maybe this weekend. Um, they're pieces that I've each had for a couple of years and it just makes me want to do something with them. But I thought I would show them to you. So the first one is related to a book that probably a lot of you have. Um, it's The book is called um, Stephanie Pearl McPhee Casts Off the Yarn Harlot's Guide to the Land of Knitting. So this book came out in like 2007 and I'm sure I bought this book when she was on tour. So I was going to a lot of those kinds of knitting events at, at that time. And uh, I think it was probably even before Ravelry or in the very early days of Ravelry. So a lot of us were meeting through, meeting through Stitch and Bitch groups and we would all pile into a minivan and drive off to somewhere where these events were going to be. So in this book, she's talk, basically talking about knitting culture and, and um, the ways that, that knitters are in different situations. And on the front cover, there is this kind of map and, you know, it's got like the sea of stash and then there's like these islands and that has Cardigan City and fiber flats and the fiber coast and things like that. And then inside there are all of these different illustrations as well. Well, I never paid much attention. I mean, I noticed that there were illustrations and that this was a cool map on the front, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. But about six years ago, a friend of mine who is a, has worked as an illustrator, so she's, I think, done children's books and things like that. So she knows other illustrators. And she, uh, I think she shared uh, something on Facebook or something that made me aware of this illustrator named Jamie Hogan. And what it was was uh, some event where she had this map in a knit shop or something and she had sold a few prints of this particular map and it turns out Jamie Hogan was the illustrator for this book and that my friend who I know from a completely different <laughs> set of circumstances uh, knew Jamie Hogan and then po and then posted this Facebook post about Jamie having some prints at this yarn shop and this was the print it was this uh, land of knit and it was based on, I don't know if this was 
I don't think this is the exact map that was on the cover, but it was based on that maybe. But anyway, I loved it and I wanted a copy of it. <laughs> and, I was, and I tracked Jamie down. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love that. How, how can I get a copy of that? And I don't think, she, I think she had made a few prints and had sold them at this yarn shop and didn't have any more. And I'm like, no, oh my God, I want, I want a copy of this. So, and then I was telling, I told some people on Ravelry about it and, the, and a number of people bought them. So she, she printed up a few more of these posters and then she sent one um, to me and she sold the rest. And I just looked, she has an Etsy shop of illustrations, but she doesn't have this one anymore. Um, most of her prints are things, illustrations from like children's books or other things that she's done. She doesn't have that anymore. That was something that, um, that was the first sort of piece of artwork that I bought for this office. Then about, so that was like 2014 or something like that. Um, and the book came out in 2007. It was probably 2014 when I, I got that print. And then about four or five years ago, I went to a retreat um, that uh, Stephanie Pearl McPhee uh, puts on. She does these retreats in Port Ludlow, Washington, three times a year. And they're like, three days long and there's three teachers. And uh, so I met my friend Margaret on that retreat. Um, we shared a, a room together. She lives here. I did an interview with her last fall where she's an independent dyer and she was just um, starting to um, to sell her yarn wholesale. We were visiting yarn shops on our way to the retreat from between the airport and uh, where the retreat was. They were like four or five, six different yarn shops and we stopped at that, each one of them and she showed them her yarns. Um, so at this retreat on the very last night, they had um, like door prizes. They were doing little drawings. I never, I shouldn't say never. I rarely win door prizes. I don't count on it. I don't get excited about it. I just assume that I'm not going to win. And they called my name and somebody had brought this picture. She'd had it. She didn't have room for it wherever she was living. And she thought somebody at the retreat might want it. I want it. I saw how big it was. I didn't know if I'd be able to get it home, but I brought a really big suitcase and checked a bag because I had two friends in Washington, one of whom I stayed with before the retreat and the other was my college roommate who I spent three nights with uh, after the retreat. So I needed to bring enough clothes and I had to bring all these knitting supplies for the retreat and all that. So I actually had a suitcase that was big enough. It hasn't been up here in the office because I, I didn't have the wall space, but I think I figured out uh, where I'm going to put it. But so it's been leaning up against the wall in my bedroom right next to my bed. So I see it every day. When I get out of bed in the morning, I see it. When I get into bed at night, I see it and I love it. And I especially, I love it even more now, which is why is it, I want to bring it up to my office. Um, and I'll show it to you in a second. Um, I'll show it to you now. So this is the picture. It's, you know, obviously a woman during World War II knitting um, something, scarf or something for her soldier boyfriend. And I've always loved it, but I especially love it now because of all of the vintage knitting I'm doing and then having bought all of these 1940s vintage um, books from the UK and my next vintage sweater when I finish my 1920s sweater, which I'm going to get back to very soon. Um, my next vintage sweater is going to be 1940s sweater. So I want to put this, I have a corner of my office, that corner, which is really hard to get at, that I think I can mount this on the wall if I the hard part is going to be getting to that corner because I have so many bookcases in my desk and everything. But I want to be able to see it when I sit at my desk. That land of, of knit poster is one that's to my left when I'm sitting at my desk and I want this one to be to my right um, so that I can look up at it uh, when I'm sitting at my desk. I have no, I have no idea of what the source of this picture is, like the, wh where the print came from, who the art, original artist was. There's a signature at the bottom, Mary Evans, copyright Mary Evans, except that the actual painting or, or pic, original picture has somebody else's last name. So I don't, 
I don't really know uh, what it's from. If anybody recognizes that image and knows where it came from, I'd love to know. So the last thing is something I bought just a couple of years ago and I looked and this is still available. Um, this woman has an Etsy shop. I think I saw it on Facebook and I loved it and I followed the links until I found uh, where to buy it. It's just like an 11, eight, an eight and a half by 11 you know, piece of paper. Maybe it's eight by 10, I'm not sure. But it's called My Stash Explained. And so it has all these little uh, different bins of yarn and some of them say bulky yarn or single skeins of sock yarn, regrettable novelty yarn, UFO graveyard, baby stuff. And then there's like a bin of like roving. It says, I'm totally going to learn to spin. Um, another bin from someone's grandma, rest in peace. Um, there's a bin called Yarn Barf. There's, there's one that says actual black hole. Uh, this one says, don't look in here. And then there's like the, a box here and it says, seriously. So I just, I think that most of us can identify with these kinds of images. And if this is something I need to get a little frame for it and find a little place, I think I have a, a, some space on a wall right here. So uh, these are just things I feel like I want to have these things to look at when I'm in my office. Um, maybe it'll distract me from all the crap that ends up on the floor piled up. <laughs> I don't know. I spend a lot of time knitting swatches and experimenting with things and trying to figure out, uh, does this work or that work? Or what about this other thing? Or I wonder you know, and, and some of it is, I wonder if I'm going to like the finished result, or I wonder if I'm going to like the process of knitting this, or I wonder how does that work? Like, I don't understand it. Like I might read the directions for something and I just don't understand how it's going to work. And I know other people have the same experiences. When I learned to knit, I didn't know other knitters. There's no internet, <laughs> no, no videos, nothing like that. I didn't have anybody to ask. All I had were my pattern instructions. If I had a knitting book, there might be a reference section that could explain how to do certain things. So a lot of what I had to do was just figure it out from a book. And it wasn't always easy. Sometimes it was a struggle. What I noticed a lot of times was if I'd read through a pattern, you know, see, you know, what are they asking me to do here? What, are, you know, what did, and, and I'd come to a section that I didn't understand. I wouldn't assume that I couldn't get started. <laughs> I would go ahead and get started. I think a lot of knitters, if they see something in a pattern that they don't understand before they've ever even cast on the first stitch, they think they need to understand that first. And instead, a lot of times it becomes more obvious once you have the knitting on your needles and it's in front of you and you've been creating the fabric and you kind of see what's going on. When they give you an instruction, it's, it's obvious or more obvious than it is if you have nothing except, you know, trying to, to imagine something in your head that you had never seen before. Most of the time, when I am knitting, I can knit in my head because I understand so much about how knitting is interconnected and how it works. And I'm, I'm familiar with enough techniques and oh, this sounds very much like that technique. So it's very easy for me to visualize what to do or at least understand, oh, I, I know they're doing short rows or they're doing this. I understand what's going on in, in terms of a big picture. But once in a while, I'm presented with instructions where I really don't know what is happening. Or I might understand the individual instructions, but I don't necessarily know what that result is going to be. Or I certainly don't know what the experience of knitting it is going to be. So I have some tools that I use um, to help me knit when I have instructions that are just swimming with words and I need to, um, to change that to make it a simpler so that I don't get lost. Like the early, like the first vintage sweater pattern that I knit started out with, you know, cast on, you know, 90 stitches or whatever it was. And then it had 17 lines of instructions that were written, knit like the words, knit five, purl five, knit five, like, until every single stitch was accounted for. 
and then maybe instead of the, the last three, five stitches being knit five or purl five, it might have been knit three. And so I could see that the beginnings and the endings of the row were different. And so that somehow this pattern was shifting it was obviously knit five, purl five pattern that was repeated, but something was getting shifted at the beginning and the end. And because it was knit flat, trying to figure out which direction, like for me to figure out which direction are things shifting was not obvious. So I thought, well, I'll chart this out and then I'll see what's going on. But like I said, they gave 17 rows of this explicit instruction. And then it said, continue, uh, continue until you have a uh, knit five points or something. Continue this pattern until you have knit five points. I didn't know what they were talking about, the points. And it, what it was, it was a zigzag pattern. It was a pattern that zigged and then zagged. And so at the point where the zigging turned into zagging was a point. And they wanted me to do these repeats. They had given 17 rows of instructions, but the repeat was only 10 rows. So what they were doing is establishing the pattern um, very explicitly, word by word, until it was established, and then you could, then the knitter would be able to see. This is just too much of C of information, and so I chose to chart it out so I could see what was going on and I would understand what I needed to do. Um, so that's something that I often use where I'm like, okay, the, the way this is presented, I'm going to get lost in the knitting and I'm going to make mistakes. So what can I do to reduce the mistakes? So that's, that's a technique I use. Uh, but another technique I use is simply getting some yarn and needles, knitting up a little swatch, and then just following the instructions, especially if it's a, for a very specific technique. And it's giving me instructions that I, I'm like, I don't, what are they talking about? That is not something that exists. What are they saying? I vividly remember learning a technique called the central double increase. So it's an increase where you start with one stitch and then you end up with three and the original stitch is continuing up the middle and the two new ones are, are coming off the side. So it's a, it's a really handy increase to use. It's not used very often. Um, there aren't that many occasions when a double increase is needed. And so you just don't see it very often. And somebody was asking for help with this instruction. And, and it was a technique I had never even heard of. And they put the instructions in there. And I read them. I'm like, I don't understand what they're saying. And the instructions were to knit into the back and the front of the stitch on the left-hand needle and then lift the vertical strand between the two stitches and knit that. And I thought to myself, there's no vertical strand between stitches. There's a horizontal like running thread between stitches. What are they, that doesn't, that doesn't even exist. What are they talking about? Uh, I had never done a knit back front. I had used an increase called knit front back. And so I knew in my head what that looked like. And I assumed that this knit to, into the back and the front was going to be very similar. And like, why would you do it in that direction? You know, I, I didn't understand why any of this was going on. So I got all my yarn and needles. I knit into the back, knit into the front of the stitch. And I had two new stitches on my right hand needle. And I looked at them. And what do you know? There was a little vertical strand of yarn between the two stitches, you know, right below and built between the two stitches. And I'd never seen that before because I had never done a knit back front. And so I didn't, I couldn't visualize in my head what that result was going to be because I had never seen it. And I didn't expect that it would be different from a knit front back. So that just reminded me that if you don't, if you can't visualize something, if you don't understand it, you don't necessarily need somebody else to show you. What you, what you might need is for yourself to show you what to do. Um, and to get some yarn and needles and try it out on a swatch. I think some people, it either doesn't occur to them to just try it, like in that way, um, or um, they, they're they hesitant because they think they're gonna mess it up. I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on there, but, but what I do know is that if you can't visualize something in your head that you have never seen, that's not really uncommon, but if you are a visual person, as all of us are, uh, you might need to, you might be able to just see what you need to see in your own hands using your own yarn and needles. So 
you know, I, there was a, a question once in the forums and Ravelry about, I need help with this pattern. I don't, don't understand what I'm supposed to, what I'm supposed to do. And they said, well, well, what, a, what are you having trouble with? And they listed like 15 lines of a pattern. And we said, well, what part of that do you not understand? Oh, I don't understand any of it. And the first instruction was cast on 10 stitches, you know, something like that. And the next instruction was knit one row. Or, you know, and, and we're like, do you really not understand any of it? Like, have you actually tried going through the rows that you do understand and then seeing what happens on the row that you don't understand right now? So you don't have to understand everything that you're supposed to do before you start knitting a pattern. Like if you, it's a good idea to read through a pattern, you know, before you start knitting it, just to get a sense, you know, if you can. But there often are things that, that I don't know what they're getting at. I have no idea what this is going to be because I haven't knit any of the fabric yet. I haven't gotten to that point where those instructions are going to make sense because, because I don't have the fabric in front of me. So, and I think some people don't like doing swatches to experiment because they think it's a waste of time or uh, it takes time away from their real knitting or something. But for me, it's such an excellent way of learning and really understanding how knitting works because you can be taught something. You can be taught or told that uh, the SSK decrease gives you the same result as slip one, knit one, pass the slip stitch over. And you can know that and you can use that whenever you come to an instruction that says SSK, you can say, oh, I know I can actually use a slip one, knit one, pass, one, uh, pass the slip stitch over. You can know that, but do you know why? they give the same result. If you, if you hear that two things give the same result, spend some time trying the two of them out side by side and, 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 and comparing the results and seeing what's happening with your yarn and needles as you're executing those techniques. Because that is going to teach you how knitting is interconnected. It's going to teach you how things work. It's going to teach you how to fix things when they go wrong. It's really helpful if you understand how stitches interact. And you learn that by paying attention to what you're doing, not just doing what you're told. So that's my advice. It's advice that I had to remind myself of this week um, when I was, before I did, before I decided to do this week's Technique Tuesday video, which was a sock toe that I got from uh, Weldon's Practical Stocking Knitter. This is a reproduction copy. You can get them as a digital download. It was published in 1885, 86. Uh, this particular one has, uh, you know, how to knit stockings, but also it has like seven or eight different kinds of sock toes and different kinds of heel turns and, and things like that in it. And I have used some of these sock toes previously in um, sock videos. Like last summer, I did a few of the toes in here that I hadn't seen before. Um, but there was one that I didn't really understand. It was the star toe of four points. And there's also one that's a star toe of five points. And I, and I couldn't really tell from the engravings because the pictures in here are engravings and they're pretty good at representing the knitted stitches, but I was having a little trouble really understanding it. And then I was having trouble with the instructions. It turned out that the instructions for the star toe of four points uh, was under the heading of star toe of five points and the instruction for star toe of five points was under the heading of <laughs> for four points. So once I, I realized what was going on there, I was, I was reading through the instructions and trying to really get a sense of what was going on and how would you modify this for a different number of stitches? Because the example was for 80 stitches and I'm like, hardly anybody needs 80 stitches. The 64 or 72 is gonna be more common. And how would you even adjust that? Like, how does this work? And I was trying a lot of more high tech ways of trying to figure this out, like by charting it out or by using spreadsheets to calculate numbers. And it turned out that really what I needed to do was to just follow the instructions. And then it all became really clear just how does this thing work? And that was just a good reminder for me because I am often able to knit in my head or just uh, use other tools for 
for sort of visualizing what something is going to turn out like, but it really is the best technique to have the yarn and needles in your hands and then follow the instructions one step at a time. And then if you can't make it work, then, then try to get some help from somebody because some because it could be your instructions are incorrect or there's something that you're not seeing that isn't obvious or something like that. But a lot of times you can solve your problem. And if you have an idea of how something might be different, there are a number of people in that video who said, well, could you use different decreases? Could you do this? Could you do that? And uh, I, I hadn't tried it. It seemed like it might work. Um, and so if you have an idea of what you think you might prefer, First of all, try it the original way, just so you understand what's really going on. Because a lot of times what you see on the surface isn't all there is to understand about a technique or a process or something like that. That there, there's more to it that you just can't see until you're actually physically doing it. And then once you have gone through it the original way, then see if your idea still makes sense to you and then try it and then compare the two. And you may end up saying, well, I don't really like the original. I don't quite like this. Maybe I'm gonna try this next. And you can try and experiment all the different ways. And this, this is a fantastic way to learn and also to understand not just a new sock toe or something like that, but how knitting works and how stitches are interconnected. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.